Thank you. Thank you, dear Annette. Um, very rare in our lives, um, we find people who make us remember and makes us, you know, touch with our own self, with our own divinity. And I think um, uh, you had the opportunity to have someone like that in your own life. Um, and uh, so it would be an honor to hear from you about your teacher um, and when did you first met her and um, yeah and then a few more questions around that but uh, thank you thank you dear Madhu it's such a joy to share you know this special occasion I was given in my life which I see as pure grace and First, maybe I tell you a little bit the context because I was for a longer time already looking for a spiritual guide. It started actually when I was 14 years old that there was such a longing to understand why I'm here on earth, what is the divine and how can I connect with the divine. And then it took a long time and so on. And then there was this opening where spiritual traditions were available for so-called normal human beings, not being a special group only, um, in a hidden way that the secrets of the sacred paths were kept for a long, long time. So we had access to that. I was practicing for quite a long time Tibetan Buddhism and at a certain point I had such a longing for a guidance. At that moment I had a family already, two little children and I had to earn my money, I had to live in this world and I couldn't find really a spiritual guidance in the Tibetan Buddhist context because actually traditionally at that time it would have been meant to go three years, three months, three days in a cave to really go deeply, deeply into meditation and I was not able. So I was really crying out and um, one day I went to um, a bookshop and there I found this little book like Phoenix out of ashes and I took it and I read it and it was like a revelation it was like going to the roots to the roots the roots of the roots actually <clears throat> in the transformation of a human being and I thought, wow, that is what my heart is longing for, to have really the chance to use this life for becoming a conscious human being, very simply. So I immediately wrote to the publisher, where is this master or this lady called Irina Tweedy? Ah, she's in London. And at the same time, that was 1981, uh, we were preparing, a friend of me, especially Rashna Imhasli, made a big conference having place in Davos, where His Holiness Dalai Lama and many, many, you know, from the transpersonal international association, they gathered a lot of important people like Kübler Ross and others, spiritual teachers from all different spiritual traditions. Then I told them, oh, you should invite in Arena Tweedy also to this conference. So they did, <clears throat> and she was there. And that was also the first time I could meet her. So I had one day off for the little children, went to Davos, and for me the most important was really to meet her. So she invited me to come to her hotel room 
And I remember very well, I was very nervous. Entering her room and then everything got blank. I don't remember anything. It was just blank. I don't even remember how I got out of it, of the room. So that's actually a very interesting experience. It's like experiencing the void as a first encounter with her. At the same evening, I was invited together with her to have a meeting with His Holiness Dalai Lama, where a little group was invited to meet him and I was at her side. That was very just beautiful to be with her, near her. So that was my first meeting with Irina Tweedy. Then I started to invite her to come to Switzerland. And uh, because I was at that time afterwards the president of the, trans, of the International Trans Person Association being in Switzerland located. And I had there the chance to invite many spiritual teachers. So I invited her also to come and I observed her. I didn't understand what Irina Tweedy was doing. I just was confused. <laughs> Every norm or expectation I had didn't occur. And, and I was fascinated somehow, drawn into, I didn't know how to name it. So she invited me to come to London. So I did go to London as soon as possible because I was working at that time in the third world development work in SwissAid. So whenever I traveled, I tried to go over London <laughs> and did my work uh, connect to see her. So I was going to her in front of her door. I rang the bell. And I was full of expectations. Now it would happen, the big wonder somehow. She opened the door, having a little stick of the toilet in her hands and asked, t telling me, welcome. I just clean the toilet because I had 100 people here so that it is nice for you. And I entered. And then she made some food for me, spinach and potatoes, I very well remember. And I always was waiting now, there is something happening, you know. There must be some wise special words coming, you know, to enlighten my whole being. No, just eating lunch with her. Then she said to me, you must be very tired because I came from Zimbabwe. I had a long flight. You better go to sleep. So I went to sleep. And it was very, in a way, ordinary, but not ordinary, you understand? And she just took all away my expectations, you know? So that was my first personal meeting with her where she invited me to come to London. And I observed her, invited her every year to come to Switzerland. And I didn't understand who she was. I just couldn't get an idea. And also in her talks, I somehow didn't understand what she was talking about. But I remember later that what she said was somehow not stored, but in resonance with my own heart. And it would drop out. It's not a remembering through the brain. It's a remembering in the heart. At the right time, with the right people, I just knew what she was saying and could, in a way, share it with other people. So it was completely different. And after <clears throat> three years of observation, not understanding, but fascinated, by her completely because she was really what she was saying living and that impressed me very deeply because meanwhile I had so many 
meetings with other spiritual teachers and there were very few that there was the way of living and the way a person talked about it was one. And then I went to her and asked her after three years of observation if I may become her student. Well, thank you. Thank you, dear Annette. Um, so lovely, so lovely to hear that. And, um, and also for me personally, because when I hear that, it just, um, it reminds me how the, the, the whole life is sacred. You know, there's nothing which makes it, uh, in Hindi we used to use a word, ki jivan swem hi pavitra hai. Life itself is sacred. You know, and I think, um, your experience and how to and and my another one of my elders is to say ki jivan ke saath samvai karna so to be in harmony with life to be as we speak or as we uh, work you know as it should be in harmony you know what who we are and what we aspire to or uh, think about thank you i was just very um, curious to to go further in the yeah, journey yeah. and 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 um, know more about um, uh, any any more stories around that? Like yeah, how instances here? Yeah. You come, I tell you. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And then um, some aha moments, and um, yeah, also your own personal struggles, yeah, and, yeah, and exactly. at the same time, the growth which you felt yeah. that. Thank yeah. you, thank you for sharing these. Yeah. So Mrs. Tweedy accepted me as her student, and that was like an explosion. It was. Very interesting. First of all, I was so afraid to look inside of me, meeting my dragons and dark side. And I knew somehow in myself that asking to be a student of her, a devotee of her, it will, I will have to face my shadow sides. And I was so afraid of them. You, you, it's like, I cannot explain, but it was like the decision to jump from a cliff into the sea, not knowing where you're landing. And what I did, and I tell that because maybe it also helps other people, I did like an extrapolation inside if I don't meet my shadows, what does it make out of my life? And it was just gray. Then I said, well, no, I jump. So I jumped. And <clears throat> I, of course, listened very carefully what Mrs. Tweedy said to me, but also I was, I was trying to go as often as possible to London to be in her presence because I read, of course, Daughter of Fire, her book where all the details of her training was written down by Mrs. Tweedy. And <clears throat> I started to really clean up my life in every aspect. So, the areas I have cheated, I had to look at. Uh, where I was not precise, you know, superficial in certain ways in my life, I had to look at. And it was for me, nearly for two years, like digging in a cave, you know, all <laughs> the things that I didn't want to look at, and I did that. In that area also, I had to look at the relationship with my husband and the two children, because in a way we were like brothers and sisters, and we started to hinder each other in our development of the soul. And I figured out that for the children it would be a bigger karma we create if we don't look at that area and if we are not honest with each other. And 
it was for me, I think, one of the hardest things um, to allow to look closely into that inharmonious area because family was so important for me. <clears throat> so we did and we decided both, my husband and ex-first husband and me, to separate but being in charge of the children both together and I always had inside no feeling of separation with him from the heart. It was more an outer movement where we finally, when we separated also officially after I think nine years later because the children didn't want the official separation, we respected that. We celebrated that we let go of each other, being united on a deeper level, because you cannot separate when you love somebody and you have children. You cannot, you know, say, I have nothing to do with this person. And I had an inner vision that the family just becomes bigger. And that was really now the case. We managed to harmonize the whole situation. And I'm so thankful nowadays that we had the courage to look deeper into that matter. But that was only one areas what I had to look at. <clears throat> and um, so I did silently my work, inner work, meeting the shadows, meeting all the things that were not in harmony. At the same time, I started the practice, the spiritual practice, she told me to do and that was a practice of 24 hours. You have 30 minutes of meditation each day which was possible to do because I had the children, I had to do the work to earn some money, to you know, all that. <clears throat> and the rest of the time we had a mantra praxis. So it, the meditation praxis is to let go of everything. It is emptying our being into nothingness, dropping into love that leads us to that that has no name. And the mantra praxis is pinpointing our mind to oneness in the here and now. And I learned so much <clears throat> doing this. And beside that, um, we had worked with spiritual dream working. So I had a diary where I wrote my dreams because in the dreams, you in a way, in a way encounter the whole world you are in resonance with. <clears throat> and looking at shadow figures and light figures, archetypes and all of that, um, you become more and more aware that the whole world is in me, it's not out there. And because you work with all these apparent pictures coming up in the dream world, knowing that you are in resonance with it, <clears throat> you have to all these different aspects, you develop compassion. And in a deeper sense, you become a world citizen, loving what is. And even more than that, you become a cosmic being because it's not only our world, it is much vaster than that. So I went <clears throat> always to Mrs. Street whenever I could. <clears throat> and she had always the group in the afternoon from two to six, in the meantime some tea. And for five years, I was just sitting in a corner listening. I did never tell a dream. I was afraid 
because we were 100 people and I was shy, afraid also to expose myself completely, to show myself bare, naked. And she was always kind with me and for five years. And I had never a time where she kicked, for example, somebody out because Mrs. Tweedy had also a sort of light. What she used sometimes when it was necessary to, like Kali, I cannot say differently, to correct something which through kindness and love would not move away, which was a main hindrance in the human being to grow. And I was glad I had these five years because I would have run away because she had such a power in being you cannot imagine. What was for me a very extraordinary chance, she received me also privately very often and I could tell her everything, everything. And Mrs. Tweedy, <clears throat> her origin, she was born in Russia. She was a very well-educated woman, had to flee in the Russian Revolution, landed in Vienna with her two sisters and her father and got married in England twice. <clears throat> and her last husband she loved very, very much. And he died also, like the first one. And she was desperate. And this desperateness put her on the way, of the spiritual way, where she finally ended up in India and met her teacher and dedicated her life completely, surrendering to this Sufi tradition of Nakshbandiya Muchadidiya. <clears throat> she had to write the book, Daughter of Fire, and then was sent to the West. <clears throat> So, she was, in a way, living in this world before, knowing, traveling a lot, I think speaking seven languages, being also an artist, in, she played guitar and, and other things. So she knew, in a way, how the world is functioning. So I could come, you know, with my very worldly problems I had and talk to her. And she always had an ear. She always had an understanding. I mean, for me, that was, uh, uh, you know, that was, I, I fi don't find words because even the hiddest corner, the most hidden corner in myself, I could share and ask for advice. And she was so wise. She was so wise. And <clears throat> also with other people, you know, it was after 68, 72, 70, you know, going into the 80s, there was these wild people coming, you know taking drugs and things like that, asking uh, what does it do and what did Mrs. Tweedy, she went to America with Dr. Engel and took LSD just to explore if this helps the people or not. You know, she was just a great, great, wonderful being beyond words really for me and she was a woman you know and what I estimated so highly was that in a way the transcendent and the immanent principle of the divine it was integrated with her it was one, 
because very often you have a strong tendency, not a strong, but a subtle tendency also to heighten the transcendence principle and not the imminent. And also I experienced her as completely universal. You know, <clears throat> her teacher said that the path of love, which I call it, is so old like humanity and it's universal. Of course, she also talked about Sufism, but very little. For me, she was <clears throat> rooted, no doubt, very much in this path of Sufi, which was not linked especially to a Muslim tradition. She was an atheist. Her teacher was a Hindu. And the teacher of a teacher was a Muslim. And I came from the Catholic background. So it doesn't matter the background. It's really about being a conscious human being, loving, loving, loving what is. So she had a universal spirit for me which was so much in resonance with my heart. <clears throat> so also she was very wise in telling us that if a teacher says something, you have to look inside if that is really true for your heart too. You are not giving up, you know, the responsibility to the teacher completely, no. Yes, you, ha you surrender somehow, That's no, but it's not to the teacher, it's to the essence of the essence, which is everywhere, nothing all at once. So she said, you have, it's also a path for adults, it's not for children. She said that very often. And as I said, I listened to her very, very carefully, taking every hint up and trying to integrate it. And I was able to write her letters because I wrote in her book that she always wrote letters. She read it the same. I, I started to do the same. You know? <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> sometimes she answered, sometimes she didn't. And still, I was shy. I didn't open yet myself completely, although I understood <clears throat> how projection works, because being with her, with 100 people, it's like sitting in a cooking pot, you know, it's boiling. And every uncovered projection you have hidden in yourself in the unconscious realm of the being, you had somebody sitting in front of you incorporating exactly that principle. So there was a lot of work to do, you know, because for everything that was not clear in you, you had a wonderful projection. For example, there was a lady with blue eyes, I remember very well, red hair, sitting always to the feet of Mrs. Tweedy. I thought that's the last thing you could do, you know. <laughs> I got angry <clears throat> at this lady. And then I had to remember, aha, what is going on? That's the projection of me. Because I was not completely myself. I hold back in an artificial way. So that was one point of, uh, you know, this energy how, that didn't move and the other point represented her. So understanding that, I said, oh, I've, I understand. Ah, oh, that's why I react. Because it's not about reacting, 
living consciously means that you know thyself, you have cleared your field, and if something is happening like that, you understand, ah, I create that. <laughs> it's not this person, it's my, my world that I create myself. So there was a lot of doing like that, and then I, we, we did a big um, Sufi camp. First in Switzerland one, and then in Germany. And in Germany there were 500 people coming, and it was for 14 days. George and I prepared, my second husband. It was a year's preparing, because 500 people from different countries all over the world and we have chosen a place where they prom promised us it was all new, they would finish at that point when the Sufi camp would take place. It wasn't finished. Mrs. Tweedy arrived and had to go over a provisional board, no steps, because it was not finished. And she said, Annette. What are you doing? And because everything was already prepared, the room where we got it was finished and that was very beautifully done. And also the other things we managed to really do. That wow, wow, wow. George and I, we just stand there keeping somehow the walls in place because it was such a challenge. And um, finally, it was a very good camp. Um, this, we had to master many difficulties. But you learn and grow also through difficulties. Not personal one, it was now in a bigger context. And then, when it finished, and I have already planned to go to London back 10 days later, she said, I have cheated, you have cheated with the money. Um, and she, and I, I, because she asked me in a way to, in, to prepare the next Sufi camp for a thousand people. So I took some money aside to be able you know, to prepare that, because I didn't take any money for anything I did for her, no, never. <clears throat> and this money I put beside was, but that was only the superficial, she told me later that her teacher said she had to do that with me, so it was the first stroke I experienced. And ten days later I went anyway to her and she told everybody that I was cheating. And you know, <clears throat> I think that's a very important experience I was able to do because before I was the organizer, so people, all these 500 people were friendly and you know, you know, finding that I'm something special. <clears throat> and after that, all these people, because I has, have cheated, according to Mrs. Tweedy, turned away. So, I had a lesson how collective, um, unconscious behavior works. It's a very hard lesson. And I knew that I haven't done that. And I learned to just stick to my truth. At the same way, I couldn't enter anymore her room. I stayed where all the shoes stayed, I couldn't, it was impossible. <clears throat> and only after a year she told me that she had to do that. For me it was a disaster in a way, because I have put everything on one card. And I was sent like a way, I, I could still go, and it was like I could have walked over the bridges, you know, and jumped because my life didn't make any sense anymore because that is it. And then I got help, invisible help. Suddenly, when the pressure was so big, there was a scent, a scent of another world here. 
Or I had a dream <clears throat> that I was given a key to unlock the unconscious, to become fully conscious. Things like that happened. And I just continued and went to her as much as I could and did the praxis. And then at a certain point after that, I had a lot of aggression in, in me. And um, being in the morning in London, I went often to the Kensington Park, you know, to walk out, to do Tai Chi, and in a way to, to, to handle or to direct this aggressive energy into something else. It's also power, you know, when you, when you know how to integrate it. And I didn't know in my life where to go in a deeper level, you know, I just knew it was not it yet. Also my work as an economist and in the third world and Tai Chi and Qigong all doing this, I knew it was not it, but I didn't know what. And I was running like against walls. That was my, exp my feeling. <clears throat> and then one day I really was put in, in a corner, energetically, so much sitting, I remember so well there. And I started to cry and really expose myself as naked. I had a lot of, how you call it, pride. And I had to transcend the personal pride. There is a pride that is much higher which is okay, you know, that has a dignity. But I had a personal pride. I didn't want to expose myself. And then <clears throat> things started somehow to change and then I had a dream. I had a dream. And I said, told Mrs. Tweedy this dream. And then she said, you start teaching. That was 1991, so I did. And <clears throat> I was very lucky that I could still go seven years to her, visiting as much as possible late. She only allowed 30 people to come to her because it was too much, really, the one that were dedicated. And after later, even no people could go, but I went every month to London to see her and I could ask still you know all these questions <clears throat> how to guide or inspire people so that was a big gift we also had in that time some problems and she encouraged me to stand alone, carrying her work on, independent, according in the oneness, what the light talks through us. So I did, but this incident, which was in a way a separation, <coughs> the path dividing into two is in a bigger perspective was very helpful, was a blessing. I can say now the one part having the traditional line in a way going and the other being the renewer bringing in the next steps in the evolution of spirituality without losing the essence. This <clears throat> incident pushed me further in a way that, of course, Mrs. Tweedy is my anchor, my teacher. And I bow always in front of her, and she's with me. And 
you know, on a spiritual path, I am still learning. I'm a beginner also in a certain way when you go to different realms or, or dimensions. <clears throat> You have to do the steps always alone first. And then there is the confirmation. And Mrs. Tweedy and Guruji is always confirming the next steps, which develops into universal spirituality. I have in a way the gift that I can very easily connect the different paths and see their essence, see what gift they bring, also seeing the shadows, because each path has also a shadow in itself, and having a respect for all the different rays pointing to the emptiness where there is no color, just light. So, I'm honored to take on the path of love. We find the right words to honor her and the whole path and to go beyond. Yeah. Thank yes. you so much for yeah. so vulnerably opening this month. You know, it's definitely uh, um, to share such intimate moments about, yes. yourself, about your teacher, yeah. about, you know, the challenges and yeah. such a beautiful, clear and, and um, honest way you shared that. Thank you. Because yes. just listening to you, it just, it just helped me clear my own uh, and see my own journey in that light, you know, in that yes. growth. I mean, yes. the challenges you had with, uh, yeah. you know, it, I had to, you know, and then I'm sure, you know, many, all of us as a collective. Of course. We all that, maybe you could share a little bit more about what does it even mean to be a Sufi? You know? mm -hmm. And remember you did that, but for you personally. Mm -hmm. And then um, for somebody who is the, the meaning of Sufi and mm -hmm. in that sense, and maybe just briefly just mm -hmm. again the path of love. Mm -hmm. You know, the line which I took from you mm -hmm. and I understood was the one who is in the path of love mm -hmm. for the service of the whole, oh, yeah. you know. This is, it comes from you, from yeah. your teachings. Yeah, you ask about the path of love and being a Sufi. And first I would like to enter into love. <laughs> because you see, Mrs. Tweedy said, I'm always in love, but I don't know in whom and what. When she said that, it made with me because... I got very well, you know, um, acquainted with the love between men and women and I fell in love quite often and I liked it because then, you know, you just sang your song through um, pink glasses. But with the experience looking at that, I found out uh, that it's disappearing very quickly. You know, you fall in love and then poof! It just, you know, the projection <clears throat> goes away and you are in the world again, you know. So when she said that, and I realized I cannot do that till the end of my life because uh, this flavor doesn't last. I, I was interested in being in love always. <laughs> so. That was, a, for me, an eye-opener. The other eye-opener was, and that was even before that, not so personal, I understood that the divine and the human being is an affair of love. God, at that time, you know, I was still in separateness, you know, God somewhere, not being Catholic anymore or like this, but whatever the divine meant, it is a love affair between formless and form, between stillness, absolute stillness, and the songs, the universal songs. This made such a difference for me. My heart just was opening up, you know, understanding 
that all creation came through an act of love with the Creator. So this breathing in and out, that was for me such a discovery which started to melt <laughs> my limitations, my identifications with this body, with emotions, with the mind, with all that what is. And so this is for me the essence really of Sufism because they had this special perspective with, through the lenses of the old love, not the limited love, but the love that is inherently in the moment of present being, it's one. And you see, normally, <clears throat> Spiritual traditions talk more about consciousness, being wise, the light, enlightenment. That's for me, in a way, the masculine wing. The other wing, which is one, we have, unfortunately, in the language we have to take these two apart, is the love, and that's the feminine principle. And you know, the love really let the human being heart, when it's tight, melt into its essence. That is pure joy, pure love, pure celebration, pure creation. So you see, also I have to say, Mrs. Tweedy didn't talk a lot about being a Sufi. I didn't care if this was called Sufi or other word. For me, this was at the depth of any spirituality. Being conscious, loving what is, it's an oscillation between nothingness and all. Like Nisargadatta said so beautifully, love says, I am all. Wisdom says, I am nothing. Between the two, my life is flowing. So I respect a lot that Sufism brought the love aspect into the world, you know? And with Rumi, for example, when we listen to his wonderful poems, or other mystics that might not be rooted in Sufism, but more in a universal way of understanding things. Because you have also, in a way, to transcend your own path. It is about very simply being here, now, from moment to moment, loving what is. That's the core, and beside, in my case, it has grown out of this wonderful path of love Mrs. Tweedy has given to us, shared with us. And this will stay. And at the same time, it's beyond all that. It just is, here, now. And when you look at the trees, at you, the animal, with that stillness of mind, you just are in love with all that is.